Hey guys, Garage here. And a little bit ago, I started building out a test rig for 12 volt inverter testing. I figured I'd be a place I could branch the channel. Uh, 12 volt inverters are the most popular class of inverter, right? You wanna take 12 volt DC, automotive power, uh, travel trailer power, most, most travel trailers, RVs at their basic level are 12 volt systems. And you wanna convert that into 120 volts AC. So you can power stuff in your trailer or whatever job site tools, that kind of thing. You wanna be able to power that. Things like your microwave, a uh, skill saw or uh, battery chargers or um, you know whatever it may be, a hair dryer if you've got more hair than me. You wanna be able to test those things. And uh, I figured it's a good place to branch the channel. And about that time, this company reached out to me named Top Bolt. Never heard of them. They're like, yeah, we're making inverters. Uh, we'd love for you to test it. We've seen your generator videos. We'd like for you to test out one of our inverters. And really my response to that is, well, you've seen my videos. I, I don't can of candy coat it. If your product's junk, I'm gonna let people know it's junk. If it's good, I'm gonna let people know it's good. And so they sent me one and that speaks for them. They got confidence. I like it. So they sent me this. It's a 2000 watt pure sine wave inverter. Now, when I do 12 volt inverter testing, I'm not gonna go really beyond if maybe not much more beyond, but I don't plan to go beyond 2000 watts. And simply because 12 volt systems require massive battery power to go beyond 2000 watts. Even this little guy at 2000 watts to really put out its full rated power takes a tremendous amount of battery. Um, people think that they can buy any of these big inverters like, oh man, I got this 3000 watt inverter and they slap it on a 55 amp hour car battery and they expect it to put out 3000 watts. Not going to happen. The cables required to do that kind of stuff when you get up to say to 3000 watts and that are like garden hoses. It's not a place I want to be testing and I don't recommend anything really over 2000 watts for 12 volt. That's my opinion. Yours may differ. That's what I recommend. So yeah, these guys, Top Bowl sent me a 2000 watt because that's what I requested. They sent it to me. We're going to take a look at it. We're going to test the heck out of it. Uh, we're going to see if we can blow it up. Hopefully not. And um, let's get on it. All right, going with tradition, I do not do unboxing videos. Colossal waste of time. So this is what comes in the package. You get your inverter. You have mounting feet that are already attached. I took these off, mounting screws in the bottom. They're actually really nice mounting feet. Um, I'm going to be mounting this a little differently, so I went ahead and took these off. You get a user manual. You have a remote turn-on, which is just a latching switch for remote turn-on. You get some power cables. They're dual 8-gauge power cables. Copper ends. Look reasonably well-built right skirting the very edge of the current rating capacity that a 2000 watt inverter will need. These will probably get a little bit warm. I don't think I'm going to use these in my testing, but just know that it did come with these. I would say it's probably going to handle the rated output. Um, okay, but you're going to start getting some heat in something this size. Um, one other thing that I noticed on here, looking inside, they actually soldered the end of these eight gauge wires and then crimped them. I have no clue why they would do that. That is really, really bizarre. You can see it there. You should not have soldered and then tried to crimp um, on top of the solder. Um, should have mated those together if you wanted to do it and then crimp. Now, I can say, though, this is a very nice cable. Uh, it does, in fact, look like 8-gauge. And it's very soft. It's a silicone jacketing. And I like that they use 2-8-gauge simply because it makes it a lot easier to run these cables and uh you know route them and that kind of thing because these things are just squishy and nice so comes with that uh let's see what else do we have it came with a whole bunch of extra fuses eight extra 30 amp little fuses so we'll take a look at where those are going to go no idea why the camera's not focusing we'll take a look at on the, where where those go if we ever need to replace them because on the inverter itself look over here to this side and this side we have no fuse access To go through the features of this inverter, we are just going to use Topol's own literature. So, there are some funny typos in this and some little things because, hey, you know what? I forgive them. They're translating to English from a marketing company and they just give the product to a marketing company. They write this stuff. I know how all this works and that just makes it kind of funny to me. So, I laugh at the little 
the little misspellings and a little bit of information or the, the bad translation, but this is always fun for me. So let's just dive into it. So the display screen itself on the inverter, overload protection indicator, load ratio indicator, which I don't have any clue what this is telling me at all. It just shows a sine wave. Overheat protection, and this does show the active temperature of the inverter. Fan, so when the fans are spinning, you get a spinny icon here. Output power shows 230 volts on this display. Obviously here in the US, this is gonna be between 110 and 120. DC battery voltage, so that's your battery voltage level. High voltage protection, low voltage protection indicators, and battery capacity. Um, that's a, that meter's kind of handy, kind of, because it doesn't really show you, like say if it's right in the middle, it's not at 50%, it's, it's kind of all over the place. But the most important part is when your battery is low, it does show you that it's low clearly, and when it gets too low, it does sound an alarm at the right time, especially for lithium iron battery. So this is a nice little feature here. AC outputs, you got two, you have regular USB, a USB type C, air passages, I guess that's a feature, that's interesting. Uh, we have our on off switch for the inverter, remote switch, this is your remote on off switch, and to use the remote switch, this has to be in the off position. We have a positive and negative battery terminal, and we have cooling fans. Now do notice the mounting feet on here, that's what it looked like when I got it. I did take them off uh, before I started videoing, so just know that the mounting feet are nice and they do lift it up off whatever you're setting it on just a little bit. So, all right, next bit of literature. Low energy consumption and no load mode. What that means is when there's no AC plug or load on the AC side, this inverter will utilize about 10 watts. That's not amazing, but it's not bad either. So 10 watt idle on this thing, and I already actually did test that. So it's between 10 and 11 watts. I'll give them that one watt. Um, happy with this. This inverter is a very nice size. One foot long, 11.8 inches, 8.8 inches wide, 3.7 inches tall. It's very compact. This is just the stuff that it comes with. About the only thing I saw here, it says battery cables, spelled right. Two by four gauge, two foot long. Two eight gauge cables like this do not make four gauge. They actually make closer to five gauge. So just wanted to point that out, but it's fine. In this bit of literature, 100% continuous output, pure waveform, heavy duty, more efficient, protect your equipment with an S. So I'm glad it's protecting my equipment. Um, I guess really what they're saying here is it's going to give you a pure waveform at 100% output. We're going to test that. So make sure that that is actually the case. That doesn't start clipping really bad. Seven security protections. These really aren't security protections. These are seven protection features is really what it should say. Leakage protection. Nobody likes leakage. Under voltage protection, over voltage protection, overload protection, short circuit protection, overheating protection, and a reverse polarity protection. I already did under voltage um, protection. I already triggered that and my battery was low and it did shut the inverter off. I did overload it. It did shut the inverter off. That's fine. I am definitely not doing short circuit protection on this, the amount of power this can put out. And reverse polarity, I'm not interested in that either because the amount of current that my battery bank can support if something did go wrong in uh, reverse polarity test, it would be some serious fireworks. I have no interest in doing that. Overheating protection, even at max on this thing, I've never got it to overheat yet. So uh, if it ever did, I'll let you know. But I think it's, all of these features do work. I have no reason to doubt anything from what I've seen so far. Last bit of literature, quiet heat dissipation, built-in heat sink and silent cooling fan, low decibel, no hot hands. Ah, oh, come on guys, I like hot hands. No, just kidding. I have no idea why they put that in there, no hot hands. I guess I, they're just saying that um, the chassis doesn't get hot, so it's not gonna be hot to your hands. Just kind of an interesting translation thing. Um, and that is true, the chassis does stay completely, pretty much room temperature, because the heat sinks are internal and the fans draw air across them. This is kind of BSO. Silent cooling fan, low decibel. When those fans ramp up, and there's only one speed on these fans, they are freaking loud. They're like my EcoFlows. They're actually louder than my EcoFlow Delta 2, and that has some very loud fans. So when it is in a lower power state, say you're outputting under, say, 500 watts or 400 watts, and the fans just aren't kicking on, it's obviously dead silent. So that's it for going through the literature and the features. Let's move on. All right, so I've got her open, and I am pleasantly surprised. I thought I was going to find some kind of clown wiring and, and crap assembly and all of that, but overall it looks pretty tidy and pretty well done. 
We've got a silicone pad. All of these are clamped down nicely. We've got that same pattern of the dual eight gauge. They stuck with the copper connectors. Check the torque, everything is bolted down nice and tight. The board is nice and tight. Those are where you would replace your fuses. Now that is a lot of uh, fuse capacity. That's 240 amps of fuse there. These are soldered in, they're not quick replace. At that amperage of fuse rating, if you blow those, you've done something very, very, very wrong. There was some big fireworks, so you deserve to have to take the board out and solder those on. I'm totally cool with those being solder in. Wiring looks good. I thought I had an aha moment. This is 1.5 millimeter wire. I thought it was one millimeter at first. I'm like, oh, they used the wrong wire, but they actually did use the right wire. It's close to the right wire. It's rated for about 18 amps. This short of run, that's gonna be fine, but it's 1.5 millimeter. Um, the sockets, I still don't understand their choice here. This really should have been like a, a 520R style socket for that, which means um, if you do wanna do 20 amps per plug, um, then you probably have to buy a little adapter because most of the cables are going to be a 520 style cable and for 20 amps and they're going to have basically a spade that's or a uh, prong that's vertical and then one that's horizontal and i'll show that in picture what that looks like uh, the other thing is weird is these are in upside down so i have no idea why they're upside down but they are um nice thing is that i can fix that those just pop out and i can flip them over and snap them back in uh, let's see what else do we got here Capacitors, that is one area. Let's see if I can just look around. I wish they would use more name brand capacitors, but it kind of is what it is. We do have about a millimeter of air gap between the heat sink and the caps. Um, would have liked to see more there on that side. Let's see if we can catch what those are. I'm not familiar with that brand of capacitor. We've got a very large cap here. 400 volt. It's a JC cap. Um, don't know. Don't know that cap brand. Hopefully these hold up. We'll see. Another rail, all silicone. Well, silicone pad bolted to the rail temperature sensor another trimmer down here um, i noticed that this other rail too has a temperature sensor right on the heat sink Let's see if we can get some of this in there there's our little usb board there is our display Overall, that is it. That is way more tidy than I thought. This is, an, this is a budget inverter. It is very low cost. I'm not talking like dirt, dirt, like swap meat, junk, cheap. I'm talking it's just low cost for a pure sign inverter. But it is very well put together. I like how it's put together. Um, I'm not seeing any problems here. I thought, what the heck, let me flip the board over. Let's just take a look at how they soldered this. I don't see any red flags. There's definitely some longer leads here than I would have left it. Um, these are your grounds right here. These are the 12 volt ends for the eight gauge, all well soldered. I don't see any issues. Thought you guys just might want to take a look at that. All right, so we're ready to dyno this little inverter. So see what it can do. You hear that loud beep? powered up see the display down here the fans are running full tilt right me powered up I'm gonna go ahead and turn on some test equipment we're gonna watch our sine wave here take a look at that looks really really clean okay now here I've got our shunt on this screen and right now, idle, we're drawing 11 watts, 10 to 11 watts, which is what they advertise it at. So no load, 11 watts. I've got a resistive load, basically a heater bank, 
which presents about 0.95 power factor to one power factor. Uh, it just depends, kind of fluctuates in there. But that's the lobe we're going to present this, and we're going to see how far we can take it. So let's go ahead and flip on my variac, which I use to control some of this, and we're going to hammer it. Fans have already kicked on. We're already over 1,200 watts. 1,300 watts. You can see the amperage draw, drawing a lot of current. Hundred and eighty-six amps. Voltage changed a little bit, so you'll see the sine wave changing because we're at uh, 112 volts output. We're actually past our rating already. That, boy, that escaped me. We're past 2,000 watts. And we're still climbing. Wow, we're doing 197 amps to create this power. So, 2,484 watts, uh, 2,500 watts um, DC side, and let's see, 2,128 on the output side. Oh, we got an alert, so 2,140 is about where it is. Now let me see if I can turn the Variac down just a little bit. I'm going to back this guy off. Now that we know what it maxed at, the waveform was still really good. So just a smidge under its rated power right there. We're doing 190 amps of output. From my battery bank. Voltage is holding at 12.4 volts. Let's see if I can get it right to 2000 even. Close enough. That is mighty impressive. I said it ran right over its rating. So for right now, I'm gonna let this run for a half hour. You can see it's 12.15. We're gonna let this run for one half hour, kind of as a torture test. I wanna see if this thing will do 100% of its output, a little bit more than 100% of its output for 30 minutes, and that'll make me pretty happy. Um, fans are blowing significant air out the back. The fans move quite a bit of air. All right, guys. So about 10 minutes ago, um, actually it was maybe 13 minutes ago, just before this completed its test, my battery bank actually shut down. The BMS shut down. It took me a little bit to figure out what happened. I thought the inverter died. It did not die. The inverter is doing spectacular. I was so close to the ragged edge of 200 amp output on the battery that the BMS said, that's enough, we're done, and the BMS shut itself down. Um, sine wave output still looks beautiful on this. I didn't have any issues at all. It just works. One other quick note, the display down here on the inverter matches my output meter very, very closely. I'm very impressed with that. Uh, it's completely usable. I do really wish that display was remote because that is a really handy display. What did you think of that testing with this inverter? It did amazing. Did everything that they said it was gonna do. Surpassed its ratings, easily surpassed 2000 watts. It went to like what, 2140 watts before the alarm came on. Um, output efficiency was very, very good. I don't know if you guys caught it, but at about 1500 watts, it was 90% efficient. Once we got up to 100% of its output, it dropped about 85%, and that could be a cabling loss. The cables were kind of on the ragged edge, being eight, uh, dual eight gauge, kind of on the ragged edge of where those should be. So there's probably some cabling loss, but it dropped to 85% efficiency, totally acceptable. Uh, no load draw, 10 watts on this. Um, it just ran. Topple, you did great. Uh, if you've got battery to power this inverter and a bank that can support this kind of current, this is a really good affordable option. It passed the torture test. Really, really cool. Sopple, definitely not BS. See what I did there? Um, I also want to reinforce again, as I talked about earlier, 12 volt systems, you don't want to get a massive, massive inverter. You just don't. You have 
power cables the size of garden hoses. There's no reason for that when you could go to say a 24 or 48 volt system. When you're trying to get go into an inverter that with that much power, get into a higher voltage inverter on the DC side. Go like I said, 24 or 48 volt. Um, 12 volt, 2000 watt is the limit for where I would recommend uh, you take a 12 volt, most 12 volt systems, right? There, there's always that corner case uh, where you've got that guy and he's got 10 freaking lithium batteries in there and they're all wired in, in parallel. And I don't know why he would do that, but he did it and he can support this massive 12 volt inverter. There's just so much risk in that and so much extra cost. The cabling alone is very, very expensive to go to the proper uh, cable size uh, for this kind of a kind of current draw. Like I said, we almost did 200 amps on this thing. Um, the terminals are huge. It's just, there's so much risk in heat and resistance buildup with your cables. And if something comes just a little bit loose, it gets super, super hot and you have a fire risk. There's just no reason if in a DC 12 volt system to really push it beyond 2000 watts. That's my recommendation. You guys can beat me up and tell me I'm wrong, but that's my recommendation. Um, yeah, I actually like this little guy so much. I'm going to build a little portable system out of this. Um, I'm going to detail that in another video. I'm going to make a super budget RV 12 volt system video. And I think you guys are going to like it because it's going to be really compact. I've got it all mapped out in my head. I think it's going to look really, really cool. And uh, but yeah, I think that's really, I really don't have much else to say. It's efficient. It worked. Exceeded its ratings. Sine wave looked good. Nothing caught on fire. That's always a bonus. Top Bull, you did great. Again, Top Bull is no BS. If you guys want a good inverter for an incredibly good price, I highly, highly recommend this guy. So that's it for me today. Peace out, guys.